All right, everybody, welcome to this uh, research and innovation track talk. Uh, my name is Richard Wesley. I'm a senior research scientist here at Tableau. And everyone seems to introduce themselves by saying how long they've been here. And I've been here long enough to have a weird email address, which is uh, hawkfish. And this is a long-nosed hawkfish. And it's partly the reason for the sort of fishy theme here today. When I first arrived at Tableau, I was very excited about the product. And I'd just come from a company, though, that used MySQL as its database. And when I showed up, I found that Tableau did not talk to MySQL. And so my first project was actually getting us to, to was refactoring our, our connection architecture so that we could talk to a larger number of databases. And that's sort of been the focus of my uh, work here at Tableau, or part of it, is getting data into the system. And about the time we started doing all of this, or when we just got it done, the next thing was we wanted to get data that we could use for demos and to send out with the product to show how it worked. Problem is we couldn't send out customer data. So I started looking around for other kinds of data that we could use. And this was 2005, and you may recall that there were some extreme weather events that year most notably Hurricane Katrina. So I started looking at hurricane data from NOAA as a sort of set of scientific data. And this led me on to other sorts of climate impact data like ice cores and so forth. And the thing I found about all of these data sets was that they were written in formats that only a Fortran programmer could love. I wound up writing a lot of Python scripts to get this data in there. And then every year when we changed, we, we had a new release of the product, I had to go through and scrape all the satellite data for the hurricanes and make uh, new sets of data for us to ship. So I've always had this thing about trying to get text into the product. And I joined the research group a couple of years ago. And one of the projects that I've been working on over that time is a system to try and get text into Tableau. And I should warn you that what you're seeing today is going to be a really sketchy prototype that I have built up of a whole, whole bunch of random components. This is not shipping code. But what we do in research is we try to figure out where we might want to go and then make some of these things available to feature teams. And some of the things that were in this project have actually made it into Tableau Prep. And there's some other ones that we're talking about. So you may or may not see them. But nothing here is a shipping feature. And I can't even tell you if it ever will be, let alone when it would be. Now, here's our dive plan for the day. I'm going to start off by doing a little bit of history, mostly the research side of it, on preparing text. And because this is a Jedi extremely nerdy thing, we're going to start talking a little bit about formal languages and how they're useful for building systems. And we're going to talk a little bit about patterns. And by that, I mean regular expressions, which are an important piece of any text processing system. Uh, we're going to move on from there to how do we create suggestions for the user to help them you know, expedite the process of cleaning and shaping text. And lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about reuse and libraries. So on to history. Back in the 1990s, things were at bad. Like I said, we were using Python scripts. We were using all kinds of horrible things. The languages were even slow. So the performance of these things was kind of horrible. And then about 2001, there was a famous paper called The Potter's Wheel, presented at the Very Large Databases Symposium. And it had a whole bunch of nice features. And it was sort of the basis of a lot of future work. In fact, uh, I think Trifacta was partly based on that work, too. And what I have been doing with this project is trying to take those ideas, add in some of my own, and build something sort of Tableau-esque, which means that it's very focused on how the user wants to do things. And the goals of my project, I have four here. One is I wanted to look at performance. How fast can you process text? Um, I know from talking to the hyper guys that there's a lot of interest in how fast you can get CSVs in. And we're going to touch on that. This work relates to that. 
The second piece is interactivity. One of the great things about working in Tableau research is that you don't just look at one piece. You can look at the whole stack. And so you've got this whole interaction between a back-end database and the front end of the user. So how do we get it so that users can effectively express what they need to do and have the database respond in a performant manner? And users aren't just doing this stuff in a vacuum. They need to be able to pull stuff in from, from other locations, you know, like the semantic web or other people in their company and so forth. And as users go about building stuff, they tend to accumulate some knowledge. How can we help them reuse that knowledge for their own cleaning and shaping purposes and possibly even share it with others? And so the last two points kind of feed into each other. And the result of this was something I called Project RAS. This beautiful fish here is the Hawaiian blue striped cleaner wrasse. And sometimes people try to sell them to you to put in your aquarium. Please don't do that. They die. And the reason for this is that they, what, the way they live is that they set up cleaning stations on reefs to remove parasites from fish. So if you don't have enough fish with parasites in your aquarium, they will die. So Project RAS here was a cleaning station for text. It's a server so that multiple users could be in there, but people could come in and share and clean their text. And I even made a backronym for it once I had the name. So it's a wrangling and shaping service. Now, the main thing that I found, if you want to sort of go into your post, uh, postprandial doze, is that text is physical. And this is different from the way that we tend to prepare other kinds of relational data. Relational data going all the way back to COD in the 1970s is conceived of as a set algebra. And sets don't have any ordering. The rows are assumed to be completely unrelated to each other, and the columns are also assumed to be kind of disjoint. But text is not like that. Text has ordering. It has both horizontal ordering for the rows and vertical ordering for the columns. And this shows up in the kinds of cleaning operations that you might want to do on text. A very common thing to do with text cleaning is to fill in missing values by filling down or filling up. And often when you split a column, you kind of want to keep it together because the pieces were originally connected to each other. And there's a deeper thing going on here, which is if you read neuroscience, you find that the brain, the human brain, is very physical. It's con everything we do, everything we think, is by physical analogy. So it's important to, rem to maintain that physicality while you're doing these kinds of operations with a specifically physical-seeming object. So how do you go about building a system like that? Well, the first step is you want to have a language. But why? That, that seems a little uh, excessive. But it turns out that there are many very successful systems out there that are built on a, an expression-based formal language. Tableau is a prime example. You've heard of VizQL. Well, that's actually a language that we can manipulate and use in the fashion I'm about to describe. Other systems do this too. Trifacta has a language called Wrangle. And the reason this is so powerful is that you can do a number of transformations between the language and the user interface. There's an operation called lifting, where you take the expressions in the language and convert them into elements of the interface. So in Tableau, you have the pills, and you have the shelves, a few other bits and pieces. And those all correspond pretty closely to things in the underlying language. Once you have the language translated into the user interface, the user can manipulate it, okay? do an editing operation. And then you can just translate it back down into that formal language. This is all great, but one of the really powerful things you can do with a formal language is these languages have rules. And because of those rules, you can determine a list of things, that, of changes that you can make to the statement. So that allows you to drive a suggestion system. There's a bunch of other sort of nerdy things you can do with it too. You know, translation optimization, other fun things. We're not gonna really get into that, but for your enjoyment. So what does this language look like? 
Well, I got a whole bunch of statements here, and don't worry, we're not going to go into all of them. Uh, I'm going to do four demos, only one of which is really long, and a lot of them are, are going to get reused. But these are the kinds of statements the language has. To start off with, uh, we have text, which just breaks a file up into records, usually lines, but we have also can talk about JSON, where you often have arrays of records that aren't lines. So this just breaks it up into a set of initial records. Uh, those records are just a single string, so there's an operation called a nest, which will take a column and, that contains a record and break it up into the fields of that record. Uh, we need to filter things, and there's two filtering operations. The one I'm going to show you now, you can write an arbitrary Tableau calculation to filter out rows. And parsing things, so you have a column that looks like integers, and you actually want to turn it into integers because you can't really add up strings, you add up numbers. Right? So those are all things that you would normally expect from a CSV. And this demo we're doing is a flat file, which is a fancy word for a CSV. But I've got two other operations on here that you can't do. And those are divide and merge. Divide, you have a column, and it's actually got like either two column, different columns in it, or it's got a column with two different formats. So you want to split it up into two columns so that you can treat them separately. And then when you're done, you probably want to merge them back together so you have one column again. So our first demo has a favorite data set of mine, which is the 2016 presidential election contribution data. Uh, yes, the 2016 election is still with us. It won't die. And the thing I love about this data set, which I have up on the screen here, the first like 20 rows or so, is that a lot of the data was entered by ordinary people. They go up to a website, they type in a bunch of stuff. And the campaigns, on the other hand, put some other stuff in there. So there's a lot of variability in the cleanliness. So it, it actually makes a very uh, good test case for uh, data cleaning and shaping. Now, let's have a little tour of the, the interface here. And I'm actually a database guy. And so my interfaces are not the most beautiful thing in the world. When you have a lot of data, and this file has a, is a truncated version of the file, and it has about 700,000 lines in it, one of the things you need to be able to do is focus on just a subset of the rows that you can actually see on the screen. And up the top here, we have a way of filtering out different rows. And there's four different strategies we've got, and I'm going to go into those. And everything I'm talking about in the demo, I'll, I'll, I'll review afterwards. I'm trying to get, help you get a sense of what research does and what kinds of ideas we've been throwing out in this kind of a project. So range just says, let's take the first 20 rows here. And I'm a programmer, so we start at 0, not 1. But that only gives us a, a little subset of the file. And we might want to sort of look at a random sample of it. One of the problems you get into with random sampling is that users can get confused because each time you get a sample, it looks different. So there's something you can do uh, using what are called hash functions to generate what looks like a random set of data, but is actually a predictable set of, uh, of values. So with this, and now we can see that we actually got some other uh, candidates in the mix. And we'll go back to uh, range here. Now, down the bottom is where the statements are in the language. And maybe this could be in a better place on the screen. But eventually, I'm going to hopefully avoid even having to look down here. But let's see what, kind of, what these statements do. We've got a CSV here. So how can we uh, take it apart? Well, first, this is one column of text. And it contains a whole bunch of fields. So we use the unnest operation to break it up into multiple ones. And it turns out. Whoops, that's, oh, I didn't do that. Excuse me. <laughs> Let's try that again. So we have a nest of this one text column, the CSV, and it figures out what the column names are. And now we've got it broken up this way. 
Now, when users are looking at columns, they generally want to work on one thing at a time. They want to pick what they're focusing on, but they also may know what the file looks like. And so you want to keep the columns in the same order. But you also don't want to have to have them scrolling all over the place. I mean, this is a wide file, right? So we've got this feature here for, called a focus button. And the focus button will move the columns that we don't need to do anything to over. So this is the committee ID, the candidate ID, candidate name, contributor name, which is a mess, but we're not going to try and deal with it, and the contributor city. And these have all got, just gotten moved over here. And we've still maintained the order so that the user still has some physical anchoring for uh, how the columns are laid out. Now, if we look at the state column here. Oh, and I, we forgot to filter out the header row there. So we can use the select operation for that. And we just write a little calculation. It says we, want, we don't want the first row there. Sorry about that. Got out of order. And now that's gone. So now we look at the state here, and you can tell that when people went to these online forums here, this person typed the zip code into the state field and the state into the zip code field. So we want to be able to straighten that out. And to do that, we need to divide this state column up into the two pieces, the piece that's correct and the piece that's incorrect. So we need a divide operation. And we're going to choose the state field. And I will explain this magic in a little later. Basically, what that said was keep only the stuff that has capital letters in it. So now we've got the state set up that way. And we have the same problem with uh, the zip codes. So we can go to the zip code field and split it up again. And this time, I already have a pattern saved somewhere. So don't worry about this part for now. But I also want to point out that when I have been making these operations on the column, the names haven't been changing. One of the things that I have always found a little annoying about other preparation systems is when you modify a column, it gives it a new name. And this isn't very useful for the user, because the user is thinking of the column as a thing. The naming is very useful for the computer, because they're a little the, the objects are a little different. But the user doesn't care about that. They want, they're working on their state column, and they want it to stay being called state column. So we split that up. And now, fortunately, we can just put these back together, but with the different uh, uh, fields that have the right stuff in them. So for state, that turns out to be the bad zip codes. So we can merge those two together. And now we have a contributor state column that's correct. And we can get rid of it. And we can do the same thing with the zip codes. And now that's all cleaned up. The last piece was parsing. And so we can take the zip codes, and they are whole numbers. Some of them really are whole numbers. Lawyer, occupation, and now the money, the important part. So we can do this amount, deal. Our money, and last of all, dates. So there's all these different types of what are called scalars. And this is a date. And you have to be able to know the uh, f uh, format for now. OK, so that's great. Now, whenever you do an operation like this, like split or merge, it can either work or not. So it might be nice to know, since we have 700,000 lines here, whether what we just did worked everywhere. And that is what the third form of sampling is. This is called coverage. 
And the idea is that every time we did a divide, something either went one way or the other. When we did a merge, we either had something from the left, something from the right, something from both, or something from neither. And what the system does is it keeps track of that stuff and reports it back so that you can then do something where you see where everything happens. So let's have a look over here at the state and zip code. So if you look at this, you can see that we had a number of different types of problems. So we had here was our first one where we had to split and merge and swap the, the zip code and the state. Uh, the second row was one that were just worked. And then on this third one, we can see that something did go wrong. Someone had managed to type their state into both the zip code and state field on the form. So we might want to look and say, OK, did the, how often did that happen? And for that, we have a second tab up here where we can go look and drill down into individual columns. So here's the state. And one of the things about this is we have this sort of thing in Tableau Prep, but it's very compact and they've made some very specific decisions about what to do. But I'm in research and one of my colleagues is actually interested in how you present univariate data. You know, you have a single column, what's the best way to describe it to users? And so this could provide him with a platform to do more experimentation without having to worry about the performance of the back end. We come down here and we see ah, there's only two of these and the rest of them seem okay. So that's good. It means we can do a little bit more cleaning up, but we can figure out what the, the cleaning up we need to do is. Now to return to the theme of what's the best way to look at a column, and here's a date and it's broken down by year. See how many rows there are. Uh, so that seems okay. Let's look at the amounts. Well, this is supposed to be a box and whisker plot, uh, but the amounts that get contributed sometimes to political candidates are done through bundlers and all this stuff, and so you wind up with these big outliers and you can't really see what's going on. So this is another opportunity to come in and say, okay, what other kinds of visualizations could we do on this data? So we started with a CSV file that was a little bit uh, dirty, and Tableau already has components for reading CSVs built in. And what they can do, those components, is look at the file and tell you things like, does it have a header? What, what's the type of this column? You know, is it a CSV? How is it quoted? We can take all that data and write a small script. Okay. So you say, well, why would you do this? Well, it turns out that from the experiments I've done, that this is actually about twice as fast as our existing CSV components. And it has the additional virtue that it's a lot more flexible and powerful. That reshaping that I showed you is not the sort of thing you can do with a standard CSV parser. So this is an example of something that we're looking at, can we pull this into Tableau to improve the performance of CSV reading. Now the row sampling I showed you, this is a physical thing that helps people understand the layout of their file without reordering it. And there are four types of sampling. The first two, you know, there are paging, just to show you a range of rows. There's hashing to give you a random sample. The third one is actually more general than coverage, it's a list. But the coverage system gives you a list of rows and then it can show you that. The fourth one, is top, and you use that when you've thrown out most of the data. And one of the later demos will talk a little bit about that. Column summaries, you know, how do you represent a set of values to the user? Uh, again, this is a platform for potentially future research with my colleagues. But there's also a piece here about database research, which is another thing that I do. Databases keep summaries of columns around to, in order to make queries faster, you know, decide what order to do things in and so forth. 
And some of those visualizations I was showing you are driven by the data, the metadata, that the database keeps on those columns. So part of a potential research question here is can the, that data be used intelligently by a cleaning system? And it goes the other way, too. We figure out you know, what are the most useful visualizations for users to see individual columns. Maybe that's the sort of data that a database should keep around to help uh, optimize performance. Now, in the middle of that demo, I typed in a little bit of magic. Uh, this is the topic of patterns. And particularly, the, those patterns in this system are called regular expressions. Regular expressions are a very well-studied thing in the computer science world. But a lot of the time, people find them to be almost like writing magic spells. Now, the, the computer science world, we know how to make these things fast. You know, we've been spending time since they were originally invented in the 70s making them more expressive. And we can even sometimes generate them from user examples. But we really don't have any good work on how to present them to users and how to help them write them. So this is another area where we'd like to do some more work. But regular expressions, whoops, it's too. Regular expressions are actually not that complicated at the bottom level. There's sort of four main operations. First, this is just a sequence. You have A and B and C, and that will match the string ABC, but not the string ABD. Sometimes at a given point, you will have choices. You could have a choice. So tableau there, that's actually a vertical bar, could match tab or O. A more powerful example is the one I typed in, which is the range A to Z in capitals, and that's an uppercase letter. So sequences, choices. Then there's counting. How many of something? Is it optional? Can you have only one of it? Can you have a range of it? That's the third thing. The last one is when you were in grade school, you learned about parentheses, how you can collect things together uh, to operate our precedents and things. So if we put parentheses around the B and the E, we'll wind up with something that matches tab O or tab O. I think that's how you pronounce it. Now the thing that's important about the grouping is not simply the grouping aspect, but the way regular expressions are designed, this is overloaded to do something called capturing. It says that you can, pull, you can label that piece and pull it out. So if you only want to match a little, pull out a little piece of the string, you can use capturing to pull it out. And that brings us to our, our second demo. We've already talked about text and parse, uh, but the new and divide. The new operations here are capture. And capture uses this capturing idea to be able to pull out multiple pieces of the string into separate columns. Fill, it says you've got a, a sort of header and you want to fill in the, the missing values. And match is like select, except that instead of using an expression, a tableau expression, it uses a regular expression to match strings. Wrong bright button. So this demo is the same data, but this time it's been formatted as what's called a fixed width file. And this was actually a problem that was brought to me by the prep team. Let's see if the if RAS could deal with this. And all I've done is I took the contributions data, reformatted it that way, and then added some stuff that the original user or, or customer data had in it, which is this, you know tag over here for the page or, and the date. So to take this one apart, we first want to divide it. Oh, um, how are we going to do that? Well, I've written some patterns here. And the second one describes that header. And if you'll notice right here, there's a capture group. And that's actually around just the date piece. And the rest of it is just spaces. The other one's pretty simple. It says just 
uh, only match things that uh, are not blank. So to, the, to get that date out of there, we can turn this into the date and body fields, and we can go pull that pattern out of our library. And there it is. Unfortunately, it's got all these spaces in front of it. So this is where capture comes in really useful. Oops. Capture the date. And unfortunately, it doesn't know that. Now there's our date. But since that's a property of the entire file, we want it attached to every row. And that's just what the fill operation does. Now, to make this look more like the CSV we started with, we want to uh, match the body against, oops, wrong one. And now we're almost back where we were the CSV. And the last piece is we need to split this up. And what I developed for the prep team was a way of writing a big regular expression that would do just that. And we will actually, actually needs a bigger sample. And there we go. And everything else from here on will be the same, so we're just going to move back. And here's what it looks like in Tableau Prep. Down the bottom, you can see where the columns have all been split out using that regular expression. And up the top, you can see the part where I did that little magic at the top. And that's the idea of a suggestion button. So that's the next piece. It's all very well to sit there and type in these boring statements all the time. But that's really not what an effective user interface does. I just showed you all that so you could see the pieces slowly. Let's think about what we've got so far. Data sets can be wide and long. They have many rows and many columns. So we've been doing a lot of work to help the user focus on the data that they're most concerned with right now, using things like row sampling, preserving the physical layout, and bringing columns over to the user. Then we need to ask, well, suppose they don't want to go deal with writing all these complicated things. How do we bring suggestions and other direct manipulations to the user? And for this one, we're going to talk about the hurricane data that I started with. This is, this is where this project has, has been leading me. And these are largely all the same operations that we've been doing before, with one addition and that is the fold or pivot operation, which we'll get to at the end. So this is another demo, and just for a moment, can anyone tell me what's wrong with this picture? Yes, because although that is an Atlantic hurricane, it is the only recorded South Atlantic hurricane, Katrina, from uh, 2004. That's a nice photograph from the ISS. Anyway, let's have a look at our hurricanes. This is the data set from NOAA. And as is common with scientists, they don't think about how other people are going to read their data. And so you can see that the way this, this file is set up, you've got sort of the name of the hurricane and then a whole bunch of positions, name of the hurricane. That's not very useful, for at least to, to load up into Tableau. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do a divide again. But this time I'm going to uh, I'm going to write the pattern quickly here. I did not choose a field. 
Now, if you look at this, you can see that the, that the codes here for the hurricane names have all been labeled with different colors. And this was some work I did collaboratively with Maureen Stone, who's hiding in the back. You say, when users write these patterns and they, these regular expressions and they have these capture groups, how do we show that to the user? How do we give them feedback? And this was a system we came up with so you could have contrasting, alternating colors to show where the different pieces of the, the field were. So we do that, and we've got these guys split up here. But one of the things the system does is every time you go to the bother of writing a pattern like that, it remembers it for you. And you can even go in and rename it to something useful like AFTC code. Now, we, this is the point where I'd start doing all of those uh, transformations down at the bottom, but we're going to stop doing that now. Up the top here on these columns, you may have noticed these, these buttons. These are called suggestion families. And the first one, this one, is for filling down. And since we have a whole bunch of blanks here, we're going to fill that down. This one is for filtering. And what we want there is just every non-empty field. Now, going back to the storm, if you look at this, you can see that it's actually a CSV. So let's parse it as a CSV. This is the split suggestion family. And you'll notice that there's more than one suggestion in there. And we take them and we rank them by how many rows they apply to. Okay. Storm ID. Sorry. Now, we've still got a suggestion here to split on the, the AFTC codes using the AFTC code. Turns out that the system can take patterns that you write, the produce capture groups, and feed them back into the suggestion system. So the user is not only building these things, but the system's picking them up and using them to make further suggestions. It's not just a static stuff that you get shipped with. And we do that, we wind up with these pieces. This is the basin. We're done with that. This is the store. Store number. And this is an integer. Okay. So this suggestion family is called format. And so we can turn it into an integer, and we're done with it. This one is the season. And that's an important distinction in hurricanes because sometimes they go across year boundaries. So this is the 1851 season, but the there could be fixes that were happened in the following year. Sorry. That's again an integer. Storm name, fix count is an integer. And then the fixes, if we look at that, it's another CSV. Now, unfortunately, in this data set, again, because it was prepared by scientists, uh, the metadata, the names of the columns, is not actually in the file. It's over in, uh, in this delightful document. So we're going to skip that part <laughs> and go have a quick look at the, after you go and do all of that, what happens? Well, it turns out that the last fields there are the distances out from the eye in the four intercardinal directions for various wind speeds. Now, maybe you don't like it in that form. Maybe you want to have it folded up so that there's only the the 34 knots, and then the direction in another column. This is an operation called folding in the cleaning world or pivoting in the database world. And the system looks at the names of these columns and detects a pattern. And it also verifies that the data types are correct. And so it puts up this last suggestion thing here, which suggests that you might want to fold these. And when you do that, you wind up with three speed columns and then one set of tags for them. Okay. So now I can go and pull all the hurricane data in for the shipping product and reuse it. 
So the whole point of these suggestions is what can a user do to a column? And the column provides some context, some physical anchoring for what the user is going to do. But the language is too rich for the user, so we started grouping them into families. There's also an awful lot of suggestions sometimes, and so we need to order them for the user. So the number of matches or some analog of that can be used. Now the system comes with a bunch of built-in suggestions, but as I showed you, you can also create new suggestions by using regular expressions. So a little bit more on the, the suggestion families. What's really going on here is that the formal language is all about how. You want to split this thing up. Well, you could do a capture, you could do a split, you could do an unnest. The user doesn't care about that. They want to split this. They have this idea in their head that I want to split this column up. So we collect all of those together into that particular family so that they can find it easily. And if you go look at some of these systems, they create a lot of suggestions. Okay? But the way the suggestions get ordered is by what the computer thinks is the most important thing for the user to do, completely ignoring what the user might want to do. And we know what the user wants to do because they're looking at a column, a particular column, and they're thinking about what they want to do to it. They don't want to do something to it. They move it out of the way. So we take that list of suggestions, break it down by column. We then, within the column, we break it down into these families, and then within the families, we sort it by how likely it is for them to want to use it. And by that time, you can see all of these menus are pretty short. So the user has an idea about what column they want to do, what they want to do to it, and then they can get a short list of things that are what they might want to do in that particular family. So I showed you the how the regular expression winds up attached to the project. But it turns out that there's a lot of stuff like that. Uh, and the system has other things for writing functions and so forth. The idea here is to promote reuse. Yeah. The user produces a lot of artifacts. They may produce state names like part codes for your company or something, or simple things like state names. Uh, a sequence of operations might be something you want to reuse, the patterns that we just saw. And there's different audiences for these reuse uh, scenarios. You know, it could just be within a single project, like the ATFC code. We used it multiple times. The user may have multiple projects where they collect a bunch of stuff that they use for each individual uh, file that they're processing. And there may be other people in the system, other people at your company, who might want to share some of these things. So the last thing I want to show you is a really wacky thing. It's a free format log. And one of the things that I do in my research is I create graphs for papers in uh, database conferences. And one of my coworkers has said, there's only one graph in a database paper, and it's two bars, and one of which is shorter than the other to show that you're faster. But the logs for the database I use are a real mess. And so we're going to look at how you can take those apart. And we're not actually going to need anything beyond what we've already done. And so this is what it would look like. Whoops, nope, that's the wrong one. Preform begins with F. So this is what the log file looks like. And it's just kind of this pile of stuff. And the only things we actually need for making my paper graph are start test and this thing log scope time. And because I do this a lot, I've actually got a library. Okay, up the top here, this is just for the individual project. But these are ones that are shared between projects. And I've got three of them here. And they've got capture groups. I've gone and debugged them. They work really well. So the first thing we want to do is connect the start text piece to the log scope here. This, again, is a divide operation. We do that based on start test, fill down. 
Let me filter this one to log scope time. Now notice here I'm using top filtering. And the reason for that is that I've thrown away almost every row in this file. So we really need to just look at what survives the process. Okay. We've got a capture group here. And we, can, and we can just start pulling this thing apart. This is the dark time. This is a date and time. We are done with it. This. Thank you. Have another one for pulling out the test names. This is the algorithm. This is an editor. So another one we can split apart because, whoops, no, it's not a CSV. So as you can see, I can go through here and take this all apart very quickly and produce the, the uh, CSV that I would want to use to generate the data in Tableau. And I can do that because I have an extract button here that then connects this up to the rest of the system. Let's finish this up. And this is the second time. Has a date and time. This is the duration of the test in seconds. Another thing you sometimes want to do is just delete things. So there's also a delete family. This is the thread ID. And there's all the data I need in order to process and produce my graph for my paper. So where are we going to go next with this? Well, this is all a collection of stuff that we might use in future research. There's actually some text processing stuff that I haven't put in here. Um, there's a bunch of row operations. You know, if I find those useful, we can put them in. All of the automated structure extraction that people have developed, it was even in Potter's Wheel. It's like you show people a list of columns, and then they select things to say, learn this pattern. That's another thing that would be useful. At one point, I typed in a date format, okay? We actually have a system, and it's even, unfortunately, an algorithm that I developed to take a set of dates and then produce the date format for it. If you've ever used the automated date parse feature, it would be nice to put that in there. There's a bunch of clustering things like they do in prep. But this is a prototype. We're trying to explore the stuff we haven't done. And that's why I've been focusing on sort of the physicality and you know, how, what the user interaction is. There's even some machine learning stuff we might throw out, since that seems to be a popular buzzword these days. Now, this is all running on my laptop, which sort of works well enough. But some of these algorithms I've been talking about are very compute intensive. And we might want to offload them onto some other beefier machine somewhere, or that was just dedicated to one particular task. So if you think about how hard it is to write regular expressions, right? It might be nice if we could start generating them and then collecting them, because it's really slow to generate them, but really fast to test them. So if we had a server dedicated to this kind of thing, we could just start collecting patterns, and then you hand your data off to this server, and then it just tries a 1,000 patterns and see which one's really good, and sends it back to you and says, is this what you want? And that's what I have. Uh, if this wasn't nerdy enough for you, uh, here's a bunch of further reading you can do on various topics. Uh, and don't worry about, uh, <laughs> you can take a picture of it, but uh, the slides will also be available. And at that point, we can take some questions.